Now, dynamic co-emergence seems close to the Buddhist idea of dependent origination, especially to the way this idea is understood in the Prasangika Madhyamaka tradition, where it means the dependence of phenomena on causes and conditions, the mutual dependence between parts and whole, and the dependence of phenomena on conceptual imputation, because after all, local, global, part, whole, these are context-dependent and interest-relative terms. All right, so that's a little bit about emergence through self-organization. Now, the theme of our panel is experience, and so I want to um, now shift to, to consciousness. What, is, what does this have to do with experience and consciousness? Well, at the moment, there's an explanatory gap between our scientific understanding of the brain and body and, and consciousness. And already this morning, um, Ned Block gave a very nice um, um, account of this explanatory gap. So our position with respect to consciousness is rather like Kant's with respect to life. The outstanding question is what would it take to bridge the gap for consciousness or whether the gap is, is in some sense unbridgeable. Now, I think the best approach, maybe best is a little strong, I think a very important approach to take to this question right now is methodological. We need to enrich our resources on both sides of the gap, the brain, body, environment side, and the subjective experience side, while using each side to inform the other. And this is precisely the approach that neurophenomenology takes, and Owen mentioned um, neurophenomenology this morning, a term introduced by Francisco Borello. So let's start on the brain-body environment side. From the perspective of neurodynamics, each moment or e each moment of transitive or, or object directed experience, consciousness of some object or content, seems to involve the spontaneous emergence of a large-scale pattern of dynamic neural activity. This has been mapped in various ways. This activity pattern both arises from local neural activities and globally constrains and regulates those activities. And this can be seen quite concretely in the brain when we look at how ongoing endogenous activity arising within the brain, shapes the way stimulation is received and incorporated into the existing dynamics. The dynamics is always ongoing, and in a sense the organism meets the environment on the terms of its own ongoing dynamics. So the sort of stimulus response, stimulus processing response is true in a way, but it's also misleading with respect to this endogenous complexity. If we just stay at this level, however, our view will be too disembodied. We need to remember that the brain is in a body in the world. In more concrete terms, brain activity is embedded in at least three wider contexts. First, life regulation processes of the entire organism, all of the homeodynamic activity going on, keeping the organism up and running. Secondly, motivated sensory motor interaction with the world, which is particularly evident in the, in the examples of emotion we were just hearing about. And then thirdly, in our case, and, and presumably many other animals, social and, and intersubjective interactions. Now it seems to me entirely possible that the biological processes crucial for various aspects of consciousness cut, may cut across these brain-body world contexts. And so it may be misleading to say consciousness is simply in the brain. That's a statement that, that um, is in a way very intuitively plausible. You know, digestion is in the stomach, it's tempting to say consciousness is in the brain, but when we embed the brain in the body and the environment, then um, our story has to, has to become um, more complicated, I think. Okay, so let's turn to the subjective experience side. Here, a more radical step is required. We need to, do, we need to introduce a distinct phenomenological level of investigation and analysis. Now, by phenomenology, I mean rigorously describing the phenomenal structure of experience as it is lived in the first person. In Western philosophy, this project has been most extensively pursued in the phenomenological movement originated by Husserl. In Asia, phenomenological investigation and analysis animate Buddhist and Hindu philosophy. Common to these diverse Western and Asian traditions is the recognition that phenomenology is a cognitive skill that requires mental training of attention and meta-awareness using various first-person methods. In Husserlian phenomenology, although these first-person methods 
are certainly in play, they remain largely implicit. They're not really explicitly theorized. Whereas in Buddhism and Hinduism, and, and also for that matter Taoism, they are explicitly and systematically cultivated. Well, how can the first-person methods of phenomenological analysis and contemplative mind training play a role in cognitive science? Well, here are three ways. First, they can generate new data that wouldn't exist without using these methods. So I'm thinking of various kinds of contemplative states, um, various traits that may be introduced by these states. So this is from a, speaking now from a scientific point of view, a cognitive science point of view, this is, this is new data. Secondly, they can enable one to reproduce certain mental states reliably and robustly, or potentially enable one to reproduce certain mental states reliably and robustly, thus making the investigation of experience more tractable. So what I mean by this is the idea that individuals who can generate particular types of mental states and actually stabilize them, you know, most of us, you know, our minds are wandering all the time, and if you do experiments, you know, you're running trial, 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 your subject, you know, one, one moment your subject is, you know, thinking about something, another time he's, you know, planning what he's going to make for dinner, another time he's really paying attention and he presses the button. There's all this variable mental activity which gets averaged over precisely because it's stuff that you're not interested in. But if you're interested in the fine texture of experience, then you have to pay attention to that moment-to-moment -moment character of experience. But how? Well, individuals who can actually stabilize that in a fine-grained temporal way um, might make the investigation of various aspects of experience more tractable.